Wow. Thank you, Brother Malcolm. A very good song, isn't it? I like the choruses. Sure do. Turn your Bible with me to Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, and then more than likely you'll, we maybe get over to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, which closes out the series on, um, on the matter of equipping the believer for battle. And so we have been talking about uh, all of the, we've talked about a defensive weapons, and then we talked about an offensive weapon, which is the Word of God, and now we are talking about a secret weapon, a secret weapon, and that is someone that the devil cannot handle in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And that's a matter of prayer. But how many of us really pray? How many of us really spend some time in prayer and talking to the Lord? Boy, I enjoy it. I sure do. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, even though it's written to the nation of Israel, it's written for every believer. It says, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now, we spent some time, last time, talking about the definition of this secret weapon, and we noted some opinions about prayer and we talked about the fact that prayer is the armor, our process by which we dress up in God's armor. And prayer is the uh, power by which we go forth to do battle in God's army. And then thirdly, prayer by practice is the way we appropriate and aim God's artillery. And then we talked about some observations about prayer, and we introduce just a portion of Jeremiah 33 3 when we discuss the fact the, the demand for prayer. God's simply just saying here, Call unto me. That means that anybody can do this, even those people that cannot speak verbally. They can call upon the Lord. Calling upon the Lord can be done in the mind without uttering one word. There is no demand in the Bible that is as simple as this. Absolutely none. And so we can pray and how often we need to do that. Amen? And then we talked about the demand for prayer. And, and, and as we looked into the bottom, uh, uh, we began to look into the, uh, the parts of this verse of Scripture, I want you to notice, first of all, notice its simplicity. It, it says, just call, call, call. <laughs> oh, my, that's something. And a little fellow, uh, young folks, maybe little children, uh, they'll they call, they'll say, Mom, Mom. And boy, they need their mom. mom. It's, it's very simple. Just call, just talk. And then secondly, I want you to notice it's audacity. He says, unto me, call unto me. Here is an offer from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords where he invites you and he commands you to call upon him. And what is that? That is just absolutely overwhelming, right? We talk about famous people we would like to meet and, and talk to and carry on, and I've, I used to listen to uh, uh, Art Linkletter or, uh, on his house party, and he would interview little children. Any of y'all ever listened to that or saw that? House party. And Art would talk to these little children, and one of the questions, he didn't ask it every time, but uh, if you they ask a little kids if they'd like to talk to some famous people, who would they like to talk to? Well, here we have the wonderful opportunity of talking to the creator of the universe. The person who's actually supplying the air that you're breathing right now. 
I mean, that is overwhelming just to think about that. The God that created everything is condescending and he wants to communicate with us. And so we see that simplicity. We see the audacity of it. And then I want you to notice the immensity of it. He leaves no condition as, as to subject matter. In other words, he, he, it doesn't make any difference what you want to talk about. He doesn't say, call unto me and tell me so and so. He just said, call unto me. He just, what do you want to talk about? We can call upon him regarding anything. Anything. Uh, he, uh, his, uh, the potential subject matter of prayer is very, very important, but no area or discussion with the Father is off limits. I remember so well um, that uh, Dr. Bob Jones Sr., who was the founder of Bob Jones University, was a great friend of the, the late Ernest Reveal. Ernest Reveal was saved in, in West Virginia, but God called him uh, into rescue mission work, and so he went to Evansville, Indiana, and started uh, the Evansville Rescue Mission. And just recently, uh, the property that was given to him for the rebel camp was sold by the camp. But anyway, I had the privilege of uh, going to see where, uh, where Mr. Reveal would go when he had a need in his life that he would go and pray. And he had a little thing that was about the size, uh, it was on five acres of land, and it was out in the country, and it was kind of like the gazebo in about my backyard. And I went there and looked around, and there was uh, uh, right up in the top there, the boards all went around. He had let friends of his sign their names up there, and there must have been a hundred names of people that had gone there and prayed with him. And Dr. Bob Jones said that I'd be riding along in the car with him and he'd be talking to me and all at once he'd start talking to the Lord. And he said, sometimes I said, what are you talking about? Oh, he said, Bob, I was talking to the Lord. About and he just talked to the Lord and just uh, his conversation just like that. And you know, as, as I thought about that, I thought about John chapter 17. If y'all read in John chapter 17, all the disciples were out there standing around when Jesus started talking. He was talking to them, and all at once he started talking to the, talking to the Father in heaven. And, and we can do that. We can do that. And uh, uh, I, I guess our evangelist uh, Fred Brown tells a very uh, uh, interesting story account about, uh, about Ernest Reveal. Uh, he said every year, he went to preach a revival meeting at the church, uh, at the rescue mission. And every night, somebody in the, that loved the mission would uh, always have dinner for them. And they were riding along, and one of the rescue mission men was driving the car, and they were sitting in the back seat. And uh, Brother Ernest Reveal leaned over to uh, Brother Fred, and he said, you know what I've been praying for today, Brother Fred? And he said, what? He said, I'm praying that God would, uh, would, uh, would lead that, this dear lady, and he called her name, to make some biscuits tonight for, 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 for our dinner. I hadn't had any homemade biscuits in quite a while. And I was just asking the Lord for it. So, uh, and he said, uh, it kind of shocked me he'd, he'd say that. Well, we got home. He said, got to the house, went in. Uh, the man of the house greeted them. They sat around in the living room. Finally, it came time to go to the dinner table. And they went to the dinner table and stand around the dinner table. And Fred Brown said he looked down. The first thing he looked for was those biscuits. And there weren't any biscuits there. Uh, and he said, oh, my, what is going on now? So uh, the man of the house was leading in prayer. While he was leading in prayer, they were standing behind the chairs. And uh, Ernest revealed kind of hit him with his elbow, and he looked up, he said, look over there. And right there at the, at the do door was this lady with, uh, with her head bowed and with, uh, uh, with biscuits there for Ernest Reveal. 
Well, God takes care, uh, but he just wants us to talk to him and let him know we love him and appreciate it. So no area of discussion with the Father is off limits. Amen? And may God help us to do that and pray more and seek his face more and look to him. And so we see the demand of prayer in its simplicity and in its audacity, and then we see it in its immensity. Now I want you to move on, and let's notice, notice the dynamic of prayer. In the latter part of that verse, notice here, notice it, and I will answer thee. Isn't that precious? In other words, he's, he's going to answer. Yes, he's going to answer. When I was talking, when I was a little boy talking to my dad, sometimes he'd be busy doing something. And uh, I've, even the little ones have, I've been busy in the study, and they come and tell me something. And I remember Mark used to reach up when I'd be busy, and I'd be, he used to be trying to talk, and he'd re reach up and grab my chin and turn it toward him like that <laughs> and said, I want you to listen to, to what I have to say. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's just wonderful that, that he will answer. He will answer. Have you ever thought for a moment that when you pray, it sends God into action? We call upon him and his will comes into effect. Just to think that you and me, as children of God, are content to operate in the confines of our own weaknesses when the power of God is available to be released. And this means, and the means of that release is through prayer. Look at that statement. It says, I will. If God says he will, does that mean that he may? No, he's the only person that could say I will and will keep his promise. We can break our promises, but he cannot. And you can settle one thing for certain, he will. Now, you say how is he going to answer? Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is no. And sometimes the answer is yes. And then sometimes he says, wait a while. And so if he says no, he has a better plan. We just have to recognize it and let him work his will out. And so remember that. Then thirdly, I want you to consider the latter part of that verse, the dimensions of prayer. Notice what he said there. He said, and, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. In other words, no one can assess the magnitude of these dimensions. We would be putting God in a box if we would limit the dimensions of what God <clears throat> can do. Years ago, a pastor down in Louisiana, and we had a strip of land, five acres of land, and the church stood on, on the front end of the road, and there was a road right beside it, and all the way for five acres back, and the parsonage was on the back of the five acres. Now, it was, it was just cut us off where we could not build or do anything, and we wanted to get the, the five acre lot next door, but the man had died that owned the property, and and it was tied up into heirs, and in Louisiana, they, they, will not, they will not do anything until they every, find every heir all the way back to Abraham. I mean, they, they just, it's just that way. Well, we couldn't get to, we, we started praying for the property, and I asked five men if they would go out there and pray, and I remember the next morning after I'd asked them, and I saw one of our men, Gerald Davis, I saw him on his knees, under a pine tree out there on that property. I saw him praying. I saw him praying. God didn't answer then. But you know what today? The last time I was there, I drove through that property, and on that property where, they, where Gerald's prayed is a beautiful new auditorium, brand new auditorium. In God's time, not in our time, but in our time. Remember that, just be patient. Let's keep on praying till light comes through. Amen? And then secondly, if you're taking notes, I want you to notice the description of this secret weapon. And for that, let's go over uh, to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Look with, if you will, over at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. That's the closing of this 
uh, this series of descriptions that the Apostle Paul is giving to the, to the church at Ephesus, telling them what they can do. Look at the bottom. If you have the old uh, Schofield Reference Bible, it's right down at the right-hand side on page 1255. Praying always <clears throat> with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Something interesting in that verse, the word all, it's used three or four times, isn't it? Praying always with all supplication, with all perseverance, and for the all saints. Prayer is not a formality, to say before we eat a meal or to open up a church worship service, it's a way to acknowledge our need and dependence on the Lord and lay hold of every one of his promises. Prayer is simply getting in on all of God's promises and claiming all of God's promises. And that's exactly what it is. It was John Bunyan who said this, he said, pray often, for prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge to Satan, unquote. It's also said of Bunyan that, uh, it's recorded him saying this, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until... I pray until you have prayed. Prayer should be the first thing we think to do when we are aware of a need. Pray. Pray about it. Pray about it. Pray about it. That's exactly what we ought to do is pray about every need, everything, and pray with all prayer and supplication for, with all, at all times. Notice the description of this secret weapon in this verse. First of all, I want you to notice the consistency of prayer. He said, praying always. Now one may think, come on, come on, <laughs> Paul, why don't you be realistic? Uh, I have to make a living. <laughs> I have so many things I have to do. And for us, I have to get up and go and drive on the road to the doctor. You want me to be praying all the way to the doctor's office? Now the word always literally means on every occasion and in every opportunity. It's the same idea in 1 Thessalonians where the Apostle Paul closed out his first letter there in chapter 5 when he said pray without ceasing. Actually the word ceasing is used of, a, of repeated military assault. In other words he said bam, 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 just keep on, keep on firing away at prayer. Keep on firing away. Amen? The army makes an assault and it attacks again and again and again until it conquers the city. And, and the same way we should pray often and repeatedly until we gain the thing for which we are praying. And if God, and God can say, say no to us, we need to go some other way. John MacArthur explains it best in the following manner. He said this way. To obey this exhortation, that's in verse 17, means that when we are tempted, we hold the temptation before God and we ask God for help. When we experience something good and beautiful, we immediately thank the Lord for it. When we see evil around us, we pray that God will make it right and be willing to be used of him to, to that end. And when we meet someone who does not know Christ, we pray for God to draw the person to himself and to use us to be faithful witnesses. When we, we encounter trouble, we turn to God as they are delivered. In other words, our life becomes a continual ascending prayer, a perpetual communing with our Heavenly Father. And that's what it's all about. Secondly, I want you to notice the classification of our prayer with all prayer and supplication. Now, <clears throat> genuine prayer covers all the bases. 
a good soldier uses all various, uh, many various types of, of, of prayer that are at his disposal, a good soldier of Jesus Christ. For instance, there are formal prayers and there are informal prayers. There are silent prayers and there is vocal prayers. There are public prayers and there are private prayers. There are spontaneous ones and then there are deliberate prayers. There are prayers of intercessory, intercession and then there are prayers of supplication. There are prayers of confession and adoration. There are prayers of humility and thanksgiving. There are prayers of praise and questioning. There are prayers that are worshipful and prayers that are fired to heaven like an emergency flame uh, when we flare, when we send them up in the air. One quick prayer up into the air, it's got to be there in some time. Have you ever just said to send a quick one up there? I mean, right quick because you were in real serious trouble? Well, when we're driving down the road, my wife is, answers our prayers, uh, my prayers before I can pray. Last night we were going home from church and we always encounter deer on the road every time we go home. Well, this time we were right past by Piney Grove Baptist Church when there were three deer came across the road going this way and one on my side decided to turn around. And I, I just, and she said, stop! And I, I stopped just in time. Now, I didn't have time to send a prayer, so the Lord just told her to just tell me to stop. So I put her stop to it right quick, and I just did miss that deer by about three or four inches, and it could have uh, really damaged the front of our car. But, but anyway, uh, the Lord takes care of us, even in our ignorance sometimes. And so thank the Lord for the, that. All kinds of prayers have their place, and all can be used effectively by wise Christian soldiers. One of the things that impressed me so much growing up was one of the older deacons in the church where I grew up. His name was Jess Williams. It's, I, actually, his name was Jesse, but everybody called him Jess, and most everyone called him Uncle Jess. Well, Uncle Jess sat on this side right over here. And he would, and when he would be called on to pray, we, all of we teenagers would go down on our knees with him because he's going to be there a long time. I mean, Brother Jess was going to, he's going to get to heaven, and I mean, it'd be a long time. You know, and uh, Tommy Fleming's be sitting over there, and they call on Brother Jess, and he said, "Let's hit the floor, boys, and we're going to be here a while." And he'd pray and pray. But you know what's his sweetest prayers? Sweetest prayers. And you know what he would do? From time to time, he had a little green 49 pickup, Chevrolet pickup truck. That little pickup truck would drive up in front of our house. And my dad and him were good friends. And he would come in and sit there and beg my dad to come to Christ. I'll never forget that. Never forget somebody prays like that. We had another uh, deacon in our church started his prayer by, and he had a real, real soft voice. And he'd start his prayer by saying, kind father. Oh, when, that, when I heard that, it was so, such power in its strength in my life to influence my own life in talking to the Lord. Amen? So anyway, that's, there are many, many classifications of prayer but everybody ought to do it. Amen. And then thirdly, consider the companion of prayer. He said you pray in the Spirit. Oh, that's different, isn't it? Pray in the Spirit. Some would think this would involve uh, the, the emotions, and, and there's a sense in which the emotions are involved. But this is not what Paul is referring to here in this passage when he writes these words. It is possible... It is possible to pray emotionally in the Holy Spirit or pray calmly in the Spirit. So whether 
It's emotional, whether someone is weeping when they're uh, praying or whether they're not weeping, it, it can still be in the spirit. It is also possible to pray uh, emotionally in the flesh, getting all worked up for reasons uh, far removed from what the Holy Spirit would have. So what does it mean to pray in the spirit? It means to pray in dependence on the Holy Spirit of God in accordance with God's word. Notice some comments about it. First of all, no Christian can pray in the spirit if there is unconfessed sins in their life. The Bible says in Psalm 66, verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I think I can come before God's holy throne in the power of the Holy Spirit, while at the same time holding on to sin in my life, I am greatly deceived. That's why Peter told husbands that if they do not treat their wives properly, honoring them as fellow heirs to the grace of life, that their prayers would be hindered. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. You see, God knows heart. He knows your attitude. He knows what it's all about. And we just cannot play games with him thinking that we can disobey him and then expect him to come through and give us what we want. No way. And you can pray to the, in, in the Spirit and say, Lord, bless my family while you harbor personal sins in your life. Every Christian should repent of all known sin and do what is right in the sight of God before they can pray, as the Bible says, in the Spirit. So may God help us today to pray in the Spirit. And then secondly, I want you to know, notice that praying in the Spirit is to pray according to God's will as revealed in His Word. God's written Word reveals that His moral will for our lives. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says this, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. And His eternal will of summing up everything in Jesus Christ is found in Him, and the Holy Spirit will never lead us to pray something that is contrary to the will of God as revealed in His Word. And so no believer can pray in the Spirit and say, Lord, bless me as I enter into this relationship with an unbeliever, or as I do this, or as I do that. He will never bless that. You cannot get the blessing of God there. Probably one of the best ways to pray in the Spirit is to use the prayers and the scripture, even pray in the scripture themselves. I try to do that every day of my life. This morning, I've, I didn't do it. I, I normally, just before I get right out of bed, when I first wake up in the morning, first thing I do is pray, uh, pray verse, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And I ask God to take my body. That's why God wants in verse 1. Then he wants to want my soul and my spirit, according to verse 2. He says, and, verse, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, that's, uh, that's emotional, and, and what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So my will is to get in on his will and what he wants done. And so prayer is simply getting in on what God's doing and let God lead us in, in, as we anticipate what he wants to do in our lives. Maybe it happened to you, but not very often. You may have had times when you were struggling in prayer and, and you were finding it difficult to concentrate and you weren't sensing God's presence in your life. Now, maybe I'm the only one that way. Maybe you've always, when you prayed, you've always experienced the presence of the Lord. But there's times when I prayed when I did not, did not at that time, uh, understand his presence and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit prompts you to pray for something and he directs our thoughts and our words and giving you the power and freedom in prayer that was lacking 
a few minutes before. So just what do you do? Just keep on praying. As they say, keep on praying till light comes through. And there may be a time when the Holy Spirit puts the same request on your heart frequently and with an intensity that you did not have. It may be that when you're going through your prayer for uh, a prayer list mechanically. <coughs> and sometimes we may do that. When we go back in our prayer time, our men, I'll tell you, say, to, say to the men, you take this section and you pray for every one of the people on this list. You may just go ahead and mechanically start praying in a mechanical way, but all at once the Holy Spirit takes over in your life and you begin to pray in the Spirit for those dear people as, as their names are brought before you. It's happened to me so many times in my Christian life till I could just, uh, many, many, hundreds of times, I start mechanically. You don't know what we're talking about here? Just praying for people and say, Lord, take care of Brother J. Jones and his knee right at this time. Just, just right out of nowhere you're praying that way. But all at once it seems like that the Holy Spirit says, there is something very special about this situation that I need to really zero in on. And the Holy Spirit is saying, spend a little time right there. You got it? And, and, and that's, that's so important. And when we are truly praying in the Spirit, we can always be confident that we are praying according to God's will and that He will hear and answer our prayer according to His will. Everybody got it? Put it down. Now, boy, I'll tell you, we could spend years talking about prayer, couldn't we? I mean, it just, we could never exhaust the subject of prayer or what it means. May God help us today to get close to the Lord and stay close to Him and, and uh, set a time, set a time to pray. Oftentimes, I, I ask the Lord for a meeting place. I say, Lord, I need to meet with you. I need to talk with you. I need to talk with you. And so we'll get together, and it seems like when I get there, he's always said, where you been? I've been waiting for you. And, 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 and sometimes I've had to because I felt so depressed and so, so uh, uh, defeated that I've had, to, I've had to set a chair over there. <laughs> and I'd say, Lord, would you come and sit here? Uh, we, have you done that? I, I've had to do that. Say, Lord, would you come and sit right there? And, and let me talk with you. And let me talk with you because I have, have, my heart is heavy right now. And I need to know that you're there and that you're willing to listen to what I have to say. God help us do that. Whatever it takes to get in touch with him and be praying in the spirit. That's what God wants. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together tonight. Lord, it's so wonderful to be able to know that you care for us. And Lord, more than ever, I'm reminded of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, where he said, The Spirit himself beareth witness we, that we are the children of God. And then he went on to say, that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. And then later on, he said, the Holy Spirit help us us in our infirmities, for we know not what to pray for as we ought. And so tonight, Father, help us to stay close to you and do what's right and pleasing in your sight as we anticipate what you want to do in and through our church in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for those who uh, watched tonight, and may God bless you in and, and, and your uh, service for the Lord. Amen.